Okay, without any further ado, I certainly don't want to be on his time. Our next speaker from Blackwell, Oklahoma. Tom is a member of the fourth generation of Goodson Ranch, pioneer farmer ranchers. He has been awarded the Oklahoma Governor's Conservation Award, Natural Resource Conservation Service Environmental Stewardship Award, NRCS Cooperator of the Year for Oklahoma, Quail and Pheasants Forever Conservation Award, and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association Environmental Stewardship Award. Sharing his successes and failures with regenerative agriculture through public speaking and engagements and the personal relations we have these engagements yes. oh, yeah. yep. is an increasing priority to Tom. Relationship with God, family, and friends tops his list of priorities. Soil and the soil's biological relationships are foundational to the success of the Goodson Ranch. Let's give a warm South Dakota welcome to Tom Cannon. Probably ought to turn on my mic. Can you hear me? This lady is an amazing lady. Uh, absolutely incredible in the history of my operation. Uh, she was, uh, well it'd be back in July, in the late 1800s, she was in Missouri contemplating what the rest of her life was going to be like. She lived with her brothers and uh, they found out about a new deal that was going on where they were going to turn loose some land in the Cherokee Strip of Oklahoma. So they loaded up. They got on a wagon train that looks very much like this. This picture was taken within about 20 miles of our home place. Wagon trains weren't like what you see in the movies. They were uh, almost a moving community. Incredible amount of diversity in that group. Everybody looking for a new change, a new time, something new. Most of these people were desperate. There were gypsies, there were pastors, there were whores, and there were people just looking for land. And they were headed west. While she was on this wagon train, she did meet up with a set of gypsies and one of them decided to uh, ask her, you want your, your fortune to be told to? She thought, why not? So it happened to be a lady and this lady told her that you're going to be married three times and you're going to bury your first two. Kind of a scary proposition for a 17 year old. Uh, she went on, on this uh, land run with her brothers, but she wasn't able, able to stake a claim. She was 17 years old. Had to be 18 to stake a claim. So she waited and watched and she helped her brothers and as a part of being in a land run um, situation where you stake a claim is in order to keep that land, you had to live on it and improve it for five years. Interesting thing about improvement in those days were usually resulted in some kind of tillage, working it, planting something, maybe having some cows. They did have some cows. And uh, while she was out tending, tending those cows, um, she got to thinking, you know, I, I can go get some land. This person next door over here has not been proven up their land. So she went to the land office and for 50 bucks, she got a quarter of land. Got one of her own. Thinking she just turned 18 and uh, she had some brothers there to help her some, but she lived in something very much like this. It's a dugout. They dig it out, it's called a sod home. They'd use that sod, put it on the roof to help get rid of the, the water that came in. They lived in something like this. She lived there with the help of a cousin, um, female cousin, her and her female cousin lived there. She was absolutely a pioneer woman in every sense of the word. While she was out tendering cattle after she finally had her own claim, there was this gentleman from a little ways off and he'd seen her a few times. And he rode up and he said, darling, I've been watching you. I think you're a fine looking woman. Someday I'm gonna make you my wife. And she looked him square in the eye and she said, well, I plan on burying the first two out of my three, you might as well be the first one. How is it possible to start an operation in the middle of what was considered at that time the Great American Desert? The early explorers that came across the United States looked at this great expanse of grass in the Central Plains and that's what they called it. They called it the Great American Desert. 
Obviously, it must have been coming through in the middle of the winter whenever it looked brown, because it probably looked very much like that. If you look back in, in this, a couple of deals, one thing that you don't see in this is very many trees. That is a major river. It's a Salt Fork River in our area, and they're going around a bend in it. And there's hardly any trees. Uh, it had been managed for however many thousands of years with fire and with cattle and incredible diversity. It is an incredible diverse habitat. It's a very rare habitat, the tall grass prairie is now. Um, only about 4% remains. Uh, we have some of that on our ranch over east of Newkirk. And uh, then our farming operation, 28 miles to the east or to the west, is on ground that is considered the good ground of the area. That's my pioneer woman right there. Uh, that's our ranch. Whoa. Sometimes I get emotional when I see that picture. But uh, she has a real passion for the cattle too. And she has a real passion for the land. But that's what our ranch looks like. You can see a few trees that are down along the Arkansas River. Um, this land is really what developed in me a passion for the soil seeing how incredible it was. Uh, to my story, uh, back whenever I was young and dumb and I liked to party a lot, before I'd met this beautiful lady, um, I tried to go to school a couple of times. Epic failures. Um, can't really say it was an epic failure. I became quite social. <laughs> um, I had uh, some really good influence and some really bad influence at the same time. Uh, but I learned how to get along with people. I learned how to socialize in a great way. Learned how to put on functions and stuff like that. I was in a frat house. But I failed. I went home and I went back to work. Um, what I did there and what my work was, was getting on a tractor. You know, we, we did like a lot of you all have. We worked 12 hour shifts all summer. I would chase the combines around right after wheat harvest. And that's what we did got really good at changing out disc bearings in the dark, you know, with my little spotlight. Um, but the ag school, while I was there, I'd heard a little bit about no-till. They said it won't work there. They said it won't work here. It just doesn't work in this part of the country. I'd heard a little bit about it, took very little notice, and uh, really decided it probably wasn't for us. Well, I met my wife, this beautiful lady, and decided I needed to make a radical change in my life and I went back to school. Lo and behold, when I applied myself, I was pretty good at it. It really wasn't that hard. You know, you think about college whenever you reflect and you think, my gosh, those are probably some of the easiest days of my life, right? Compared to what we're doing now, the decisions we have to make now, college was a cakewalk. So I went back, I wanted to be in biological sciences. You know, microbiology to be more specific, well, what happened, my father had a really bad wreck uh, in uh, January of 98. A really bad wreck. He about died. He was on his way to Pratt Livestock where we were going to sell the first cattle off of wheat pasture. And that's what we did. We went out and worked everything, planted everything to wheat. And, uh, well, we worked everything, put it in hydrosome, planted everything to wheat. We'd graze it all winter. And we'd have, you know, 1,000, 1,500 stalkers running out on wheat and 20 miles of electric fence. Got good at that. And then we would pull them off and we'd cut 25 bushel wheat and then we'd start over. That was our system. The amazing thing was that looking at some ledgers, my great-grandmother, way back in the day, when she came from the east, she planted corn and did really well with it. She planted soybeans. She had incre incredible diversity in the fields that she did plant. And we've got ledgers where she was buying corn seed, where she was buying some soybean seed, you know, where she was buying oats and all these other things. Well, the dirty 30s hit, the Dust Bowl hit, and uh, she was the first, she was in the first graduating class from OSU, Oklahoma State University. Then it was called Oklahoma A&M. And they told everybody you had to plant wheat because that could handle it. So that's what we were still doing all those years later whenever I was, uh, uh, came back to the farm. Well, when my dad had his bad wreck, I decided, you know, I'm just going to drop all my classes. I can go back to school later. Thing is, once he got over his wreck, so to speak, he was somewhat physically uh, debilitated, and then uh, his mental capacity had dropped some. But he did get healed up. He was back to helping a little bit. And, and in that, uh, I saw the books for the first time, really, in my whole life. As an adult, 
As someone that was now responsible, I saw the books and we were hopelessly in debt. I didn't see a way out. Our equipment was completely wore out. So I went to No-Till on the Plains and I listened to Dwayne Beck. I hope he, are you here today, Dwayne? Is Dwayne here today? Oh my gosh, did he kick my ass that day. <laughs> he really did. I'm glad. Uh, he's probably here and didn't put his hand up. But my gosh, and the weird thing is he can do that, and you all know this, and make you enjoy it. <laughs> he really can. Isn't that crazy how he does that? Well, he really did. Um, I scheduled myself on the Dakota Lakes tour because I couldn't get, you know, I needed some more punishment, needed some more abuse. Went up on the bus, and on my way up north on the bus, uh, Dan Gillespie happened to be sitting right next to me. He was also a newbie. Really didn't know what was going on with this no-till thing, but he liked it. He's sitting right next to me on the left. We get to Hastings, Nebraska. Ray Ward sits down on my right. Never met either one of them. What an amazing story, right? What a great way to get started in learning about soils and learning about the biology that's going on, learning about no-till. Came back home, sold everything, bought an air drill. And, uh, and then we, we started our learning process. That was in 98 when we did that. It won't work here though. I kept getting that from our, our extension agents. I kept getting that from our area agronomist. But I came home, I planted corn. What in the world? I planted corn, I planted it on 40 acre field. Six acres of it got flooded out and it still made 134. I couldn't believe it. That's amazing for us. We're talking about an area where your, your rental rates are 40, 50 bucks. 134 bushel corn was amazing. So uh, that's a little bit of my story. Here's a story about a field. This field, I happen to live right there, right there. It's my house, my barn. These are shooting lanes for whitetails, and we got a little window and a deal right there in the barn. <laughs> But uh, as you can see some from this, this picture, I really love wildlife. And a lot of what I learned about no-till, I learned with food plots at the ranch and then along the creeks and rivers there at the farm. I started learning about different things that I can put into our system. All different kinds of things. I mean, I could try anything on that because I didn't have that much expense, right? This particular field's where I learned how to, how to drive a tractor. I was eight years old riding with my older sister uh, learned how to plow. Plowed up every one of these terraces. Took me about a week because she gave me about a five minute tutorial and then she left. And there I was on an uh, open air tractor with a little four or five bottom plow and away I went for a week on this whole field. Uh, well, whenever I got back from no-till on the plains, I'd heard some talk about perennials and I thought, well, this is the worst field we have. This field never, on its best year, made 25 bushels of wheat. We ran our heifers out here every year because it was easy to put the heifers out here and then in the spring we'd calve them out and we got a little post over there that we could rope one if we needed to pull it. We'd rope it, wrap it around that post and we'd pull the calf. So that's what we'd done, as long as I could remember. I'd gone out and worked this field in the summer, planted it to wheat, and then we ran our heifers on it. Well, I thought, what a perfect place. This field is some of our worst soils. It's a Nord soil. Um, it's the closest thing we have to a rock in our area. It's a little bit gravelly, a little bit of sand. Um, it's a sandy clay rock, if there is such a thing. <laughs> That's about what it is. But uh, matter of fact, it's so sandy you scrape off about the top six or eight inches and right here is my sand pit that I pull sand out for pivot roads and stuff like that or if I need to put sand down under the barn or anything. Really high quality sand right under the surface and it's about 15 foot of sand that hits shale and there's no water in it. So it's a dry spot. Um, so I thought, what a perfect place. I'm going to try perennials. So I go out here on this place that had been worked forever, because that's what I did. Uh, this can't work without herbicides and fertilizer, though, right? Well, these three stories are, are uh, doorways to a much richer, richer system. All three stories. You think about my great grandmother and the hope that she had coming into a new land uh, with really people saying, you probably aren't going to make it. You know, you can't make it. Me, whenever I was at, in school and they were saying, it, you know, no-till won't work there. And I really didn't go to class much, so I didn't hear that much. So really, my, my prospects also were very poor. Well, this, this particular field, they said it won't work. I didn't care. I had a new air drill. I'm going to figure out how to use it and how to plant something. So I go out here and I start planting uh, some Piute Orchard grass, Lincoln Smooth Brome, a few clovers, some vetch. Threw all this stuff in there. And I went out there, has anybody ever tried to run an air drill 
with Piot Orchard Grass and Lincoln Smooth Bro. Just to tell you, it will not feed. It will not feed. I went out there and I went round and round, planted half the field, everything's plugged up. I go back and I get some, uh, some 11520. I put that in there. Blend it in real heavy. Go out there and I plant and plant and plant. Get about two thirds of it planted and I haven't hardly planted anything. I didn't have any blockage monitors, so you get out and you feel for air and it wasn't working. Go back to the house again. So this, I'm going into my third day on 50 acres. Go back to the farm and I get a, I mean a hell of a lot of wheat. I said, screw it, it's that time of year, it's in the fall, I'm gonna plant wheat on it. So I go get a whole bunch of wheat, mix it all in there, throw it in there and I finally get it to flow. I planted this thing three or four times. There's no doubt I did. Finally got it all in there and it grew well. It grew really well. I was amazed at how much was growing. I had no idea what the hell any of it was. I didn't know what was wheat, what was brome, what was pirate orchard grass, didn't know. I just knew that I didn't have more than about a two inch skip anywhere because I planted it four times. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing was solid mat. I mean, it looked like cheat grass. Uh, we turned cattle out, they did really, really well on it. Went out there and dumped a bunch of fertilizer, ran cattle on it all year. And then it starts coming up, you know, and, and extending and I pulled the cattle off the same time I pulled cattle off wheat, first hollow stem. Pulled the cattle off and it was uh, just amazing how incredibly thick it was. I mean, I, I guarantee you, there was probably three million plants per acre out there. You know, we normally plant our wheat at around one four, good three million plants out there. And most of it, I didn't know what it was. Maybe four million, because there was a bunch of red clover in there too, a little bitty seed, and I dumped a whole bunch of that in there. I'll tell you how that worked out a little later. So that's what I did. I went back and forth for most of my life. I went back and forth and once I had gone skiing one time, I realized in 12 hours I can get to Colorado or in 12 hours you can never leave the same quarter. You can go back and forth all day. You all know the feeling. And that's what Tom did and I was right there. That was my job. And that's what I was pretty good at. So obviously, I didn't know hardly anything about what I was getting into whenever I jumped into no-till, except that Dwayne Beck commanded me to go do it. So that's what I was gonna do. And really, it was my only option. What we had been doing wasn't working. So what's my goal? See, I got fancy slides, right? Look at those gold. Um, what's our goal? Our real goal, and I didn't hear this really in this conference until Lee talked about it, was absolutely profit. You know, we can do a lot of great things, but what is sustainable? You're not sustainable if you're not making money, right? That's our goal. That's our main goal. Do we want to do that while improving the soil? You bet. You bet we have to. Right? We're, all, we're really, that's our stewardship goal, is to do that. But we've got to be able to make some money. But we did this forever. See my fancy slides? We work ground, back and forth, all over this country. And the results of that have been catastrophic. Just from the amount of tillage and the amount of degradation that we have done to the soil nationwide, it's, it's been catastrophic. You can see that. You can see that in different ways. And we based it all on chemistry. Because that's what we were told we were supposed to do. Land grant universities told us, you gotta use chemistry. Without, with very little regard to the biology of it, other than what your actual plant would do. How many people growing up, and, and, and as you were evolving in your agriculture career, heard people talk about soil biology. The only soil biology they talked about might be coleoptile length of your plant, or how deep to plant it, or if this plant happens to be cold hardy, or if it's winter hardy. You heard those kind of biology things, but it was always about what you had above the surface, almost always. Here we go. Somebody told me I needed more slides having to do with profit, so here you go. I wrote that out and <laughs> throw it in there. There's profit on the left, inputs on the right, and as our inputs have gone up, our profit has gone down. It's really simple. It's so simple. You know, when the, when the prices went way, way up, what happened to our inputs? They went way, way up, prices come down, what happened to our inputs? They lagged behind, if anything, and they really didn't come down much. A little bit. They say that they've came down a little bit. Nowhere near as much as our commodity prices. So what do we do? We have more bigger. We want to get bigger. Because we're stressed, right? We see what our, what our neighbors are doing, we see what other people are doing, we have more acres, more inputs, more equipment, more time, more sweat and more blood. We just go for more and more and more. They told us we gotta get scale up. Scale up, because the margins are tighter. So that's what we did, we scaled up. What comes with that? 
Yesterday we heard a lot about the stress that comes with more bigger. More bigger is no doubt more stress. Less time with the family, less time for your relationships that really count. Relationship with your Lord, with your family, with your friends. That's what really counts, right? And then we ended up with this. We got this hypoxia zone going on in the Gulf. Because we just had more, 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 more inputs, more tillage, quicker, faster, more, more, more. We got to have more yields. We end up with this huge hypoxia zone, almost 7,000 square miles last year. That's incredible. That is not sustainable, people. It's just not. You know, chemistry tends to kill stuff. Like I've heard many people say, especially uh, Gabe Brown said, I'm tired of killing stuff. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of killing stuff. What we need is more life. Then we got this. Farm debt is still increasing. This, this is uh, 2016, mid-2016. It's significantly worse today. You can see what happened in 2011, which was great for some people. We had the hottest, driest year on record in 2011, and it was close behind in 2012. So in the midst of where we'd been in no-till for a long time, we'd started some cover crops, we relied on cattle. Thank God that we're in the cattle business. That's probably my primary business on a year like that. When, in a drought year, that's what comes in. On a year like this where we had record but flooding in the spring, as soon as we could get on it, we're out there planting rye and covers and then we've got cattle turned out right now. They're out there grazing that stuff. Cattle are a great savior whenever you reach a, a really tough point, but, but this is what's happened in our industry. And that's undeniable. That's a, that's a fairly unbiased Farm Bureau slide. I say fairly unbiased. Because, you know, you, it's hard to find one that's truly unbiased. <laughs> so what do we got to do? Romans 12, 2 is my favorite scripture. I've leaned on this scripture for at least 25 years. And I'm going to read it to you. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to let you all read it, but I'm going to. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I'm a devout Christian. I believe that my faith has saved not only uh, me, but my family and my relationships many, many times. That's part of the reason that our mentoring group that you all heard about yesterday is so important to me. Uh, it started out as a production group. I was going to get guys together and we're going to figure out how to make more, bigger, better, right? Within a couple of months, the banker, the stockbroker dropped out. And then it was just us five producers left that could share with each other and talk about our faith and talk about how one guy was gonna to try to get through his, his uh, divorce. Thank God they've, they've came back together and I think it's a direct relation to what we talk about in that group. And, and we were able to help him, he's been able to help me. And uh, in that 2011 year, uh, my pivot got stuck twice a day. We were running this one pivot, it was all corn, it's a half mile pivot, got stuck twice a day. I uh, didn't have a support group at the time other than my family, so I was eating all that stress. And it's a TNL pivot, hydraulic drive. You walk out there, you work with the cables, you try to get it out. I ended up running the sprayer out there a lot of times with skinny tires and pulling it out. But by the end of that summer, I'd lost probably 40 or 50 pounds. I was down around 190, got low on electrolytes, and just about killed myself on purpose with a car accident. Wouldn't have been an accident. I'm driving 90 mile an hour down a dirt road looking at a bridge thinking, man, just a turn of the steering wheel. And all this stress and pain is gone. That's not the way to do it. I renewed my mind then on that time, went home, told the kids we're going on vacation. We went to Colorado for a month. We left. So how do we do it? Now I on purpose picked cotton. I wanted to pick cotton and go through the life cycle of a cotton to explain to you kind of how we do things because I don't want you all to see exactly what I'm doing. I want you to see the concepts because what I'm doing won't probably work here. But the concepts and the designs will. The species that you choose, the way you do it will be different. I'm not trying to tell you to do it like I do it. I'm just telling you what works in my neck of the woods. So I chose cotton because I don't think you all grow very much cotton up here, right? I don't think so. As you can see, I got a good heavy residue there. You can see some of it is a little bit older in here. 
Some of it is younger where I'd planted some, uh, some oats and some uh, brassicas, had about a six-way blend. And while I'm talking about the blends, I'll tell you this, I used to spend 30 to $40 an acre on cover crop blends. Today, my max number is 20 bucks. I will not spend over 20 bucks on a cover crop. On companion crops, it's 10 bucks. I'm not gonna spend over 10 bucks on my companions. And I run a lot of companion crops. Now, I don't run them. I'm not near as, as advanced as some guys were in here yesterday with the seed cleaner and everything. He's amazing. I love that. I love what he's doing. But what I'm doing is I'm putting crops out there that probably are going to go out the back of the combine or they're not going to, or they're going to winter kill or something like that. But I do a lot of companions too. Story in the life of this, these cotton plants. I hadn't planted cotton in 15 years. I'd swore I'd never do it again. Two years ago, I planted 1,000 acres of cotton. Don't know what the hell I was thinking, but I was able to lock in a price of about 78 cents. And I thought, well, man, if I can make 1,000 pounds of cotton, 780 bucks, if I can't grow thousand pounds of cotton for less than 780 bucks I need to be out so I thought this is a pretty good deal that's what it looked like midsummer whenever we were going out and we we're trying to regulate the growth on it a little bit the growth on this stuff was crazy this stuff was not very old this was only a few couple three weeks maybe four weeks after the previous picture I couldn't believe how this stuff was growing so they told me you can't let it grow that fast it's gonna get six foot tall and you're gonna have big trees and you're not gonna grow any cotton what do I do? I called a buddy and he said, you got to put picks on it. You got to put a lot of picks on it. Well, as I looked at my fields, I had some areas where, where, you know, some heavier, really, really heavy soils where the cotton was growing slower, pretty small. And then I had other areas where it was this big and some areas where it was waist high. So I took satellite imagery and I thought, I'm going to use satellite imagery to decide how I picks it. So I got a guy that could interpret this satellite imagery. We made some maps put them into the sprayer and we variable rate applied all of our picks and all of our stuff. So we were only using it where we need it. We do the same thing with phosphorus a lot of times, with potash, we do the same thing with all of our lime applications. It's all variable rate, rate applied based on grid sampling and satellite imagery and yield maps. There's my boy, he's sitting right down here. I thank him for coming and driving me up here. But this was a little bit later, we're, um, we're at full bowls uh, we've got a few top blooms out there, very few. You can just see a few. They're about done. So in other words, it's becoming fairly mature. We're getting later in the summer, early fall. And we flew on a bunch of cover crops. We thought, you know, this stuff is going to be so late before we harvest cotton. A lot of it didn't get harvested until January. I've got to have something growing. That's, that's, that's just unacceptable to me. I can't have something bare out there for three or four months. I've got to have a green growing crop in it all the time. So we flew a bunch of this stuff on and it was amazing how well it did. I was, I was surprised. In cotton, it works really well. And it, with my experience, in corn, it works really, really well. I haven't figured it out on soybeans. I've had some pretty big failures with soybeans trying to do this. That's not the fault of the seeds. It's not the fault of the soybeans. It's the fault of my management. Still gotta figure that one out. But in corn and cotton, it works great. Uh, that was harvest. That particular field that you saw the pictures of made 2,020 pounds of lint. We did that with 30 pounds of potash and 60 pounds of nitrogen split applied. That's it. That won't work. No-till won't work, right? That's what they say. Said it won't work to cut your rates on your fertilizer by a third. Now that's a third of what was recommended for a cotton crop like this. And I attributed all of that to soil health, all of that to nutrient cycling. Years of, of cover crops and nutrient cycling and, and running some cattle. This particular farm hasn't had cattle on it in years, but we used to run the cattle on it, so it does have a history of it. That's what it looks like the day of harvest. Look at that. That's amazing. And if you look real close, you can see the cattle in the background right there. Now, we won't turn them out because they'll rub on those big old pretty pink bales and they'll tear them up. So we've got a fence up there, but shortly thereafter, we can turn them out. And it looks like that. Gets a little more growth on it. And uh, at this time, we had a lot of grass finished cattle we were still doing as of a year or two ago. Uh, we were selling 40 head every couple of weeks of fat cattle, finished cattle. Uh, that we've really, really backed off of due to some ethical reasons that I believe we need to work out in the industry whenever you do it at scale. Now, we still do it small time. We still you know, can sell 20 to 30 locally a year. But in the large scale industry, 
just be very, very careful if you're, you're thinking about going that route with grass finished. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. The, the meat is amazing. That's about the only meat that we've ever had. Because growing up, what did we eat? You know, if a bull broke its leg or got a stifle or if a cow was not productive, you know, you'd go ahead and finish out on grass. And that's what I ate growing up. That's what I love. Um, I'm going to back up a couple of slides here because whenever my ground looked like that, for a number of years, probably around year six or seven, and uh, I was planting soybeans and stuff, there was an older gentleman that came by, a guy that I really looked up to as a mentor because my dad is now advanced, right? He, he got leukemia after he had his wreck. Uh, it about killed him. Uh, lost another 10 or 15% of his mental ability. Within two years, he had Alzheimer's, was never, never able to go back to school. But there's no doubt I'm in microbiology. So this guy came by, uh, he'd heard that dad had uh, early, early onset dementia. So this guy came by, he became my mentor and he, and, and he was very concerned. And he asked me to get in the pickup with him. So I did and we drove around and we were looking at my fields and they looked pretty good. But he said, I'm, I'm really concerned about what you're doing with this ranch. You're the fourth generation, you're gonna lose it. Thought, wow, man, this, this is the one guy other than my dad, I respect more than anybody. One of the biggest farmers in the county, been doing it forever, big seed dealer, uh, sold from Monsanto, lots and lots of seed, number one seed dealer in our region. And he's telling me I'm gonna lose the farm. Guys, they said it wouldn't work. Sometimes it takes some faith, right? It takes something more than just, I think I'll try it. You really have to be all, all in because then when you start seeing how incredible it is below the surface, you start realizing just how amazing your crops can be above the surface. Dad always said, take care of your grass, it'll take care of your cows, don't worry about the cows. Cows will be fine, especially on native grass. So just take care of your grass, manage your grass, rotate. We've been rotating cattle for years. I mean, for as long as I can remember, we've had a good rotation with our cows at the ranch. The grass is amazing up there. But what was even more amazing is what when we lowered our thoughts down below the soil surface and started managing that living system, we started living, we started managing that livestock and keeping it fed. It's crazy. Our organic matters have gone up 200% on most of our fields. Started at around one, where our average right now is around three five. We have some fields that are higher than the native grass that we have east of Newkirk. Little history on me. What happened to me whenever I got through with uh, um, going to no-till on the plains and came back? I realized something that was very, very important and it kind of changed my life. I realized that I wasn't dumb. I realized that I had a capacity to learn this stuff. I realized that my whole life I'd been learning common sense, my whole life I'd been training, I'd had to uh, think on my own quite a bit. And I realized that there is more to life than this. And this. In 1997, 98, over that winter, between 97 and 98, we had some wheat that we got in pretty late. It was very dry. And uh, we, this is not an old picture, look at the houses. This is not, an, this was going on again in the plains. In the, in the early spring, late winter, of, uh, I guess I'd say late winter between 97 and 98. This was happening again. We had this on some of our fields. We had blowing, not like that, but we had some significant dirt moving in 97 right before we went no-till. So it was actually pretty good timing. It was a real wake-up call. Because what I saw was this bare ground that didn't have much on it. I'm out taking shanks off the chisel, so we were running a, a 40 foot chisel and we brought it down to where we only had like six shanks on it trying to strip these fields. God, it was horrible. And I'm just watching this soil just gone. Um, that was pretty devastating, really. Then I go up to the ranch. And I look where we're feeding cattle. We had feed, feed areas, you know, and we kind of change them. But where we'd been feeding cattle all winter, the ground was pretty bare too, you know, because we were feeding cake. That's what we did. We fed them four or five pounds, 20% cubes every day, and then they'd go eat the native. And that ground was pretty bare too. You could see dirt everywhere out there at the ranch. Never been worked. 
But I knew that that right in there, that area, this, this area the size of this room or bigger, probably three times the size of this room, I knew what that was gonna look like next summer. I knew that was gonna be eight foot tall. That was gonna be big blue stem, Indian, switch, little blue. You know, yellow clover, sweet clove, partridge, partridge pea, and, and 150 other plants. That was gonna be incredible. What I was looking at looked very, very similar from the surface, but I knew one place, the stuff that was blowing, was dead. And I knew another place I was looking was completely alive. I thought, wow, that is, that's revelation knowledge. I've got to change. I've got to change. That's another one of the things that spurred me into seeking out more information on no-till. was the fact that I could have ground that was blowing and looked dead, but it looked exactly like stuff that was fully alive. Man, I'm not, I'm not doing something right. This land that's fully alive, it's going to be eight, nine foot tall, you know, eyeball high horseback. The next summer was the ground that nobody even broke out because it was so poor. It's never been broke out. It's still native grass. That ground was so poor they wouldn't even break it out. Real shallow, limestone, rock outcroppings, shallow soils, pretty sandy. Really, really terrible soil if you wanted to go out and try to farm it. Yet it was unbelievably productive. And the good soil, the soil that they actually broke out at the farm, best soil in Kay County, was blowing and looked like crap and looked dead. Man, that's a wake-up call. This right here is what I'm talking about. This is my dad uh, out gathering some Herefords. We used to have all Herefords. And this particular country can grow more grass than you would believe because it's healthy, it's diverse, and it's always alive. Those are the main three things it has in, in common. You got healthy soils, incre incredibly diverse plantings, and it's always alive. We always have a green root in this. You know, we've got some ranch roads up there. Whenever you run over it a few times, you kind of kill the grass back in that road. When it gets wet, where do you drive? You get over on the grass where it supports you. We have living roots. You try to drive on that old road, you'll start sliding around. If you lose structure on that. There's more to the story, really. There really is more to the story. You know, my great-grandmother, um, whenever she was, she did eventually marry that guy. She did say yes, and they went on to have a great life. She did bury him, never remarried, but she ran that operation. While they're alive, they'd have big dinners. You know, they ended up building a pretty big house, pretty amazing operation, good spread that they built. And they'd have all these people come in to eat. And it was the same thing, if it was a new crowd anyway, it was the same thing every time. Ole would sit down in there, his name was Ole Goodson. He was the cowboy that met her. He'd sit down. And he'd go, uh, man, Dora, you look mighty fine today. And she'd say, oh, Ole, I wish I could say the same about you. <laughs> and he would say, you could if he's as big a liar as I am. <laughs> they went on to have a great and fruitful, fruitful life together. But this is what it really depends on. This is kind of my key point. What if success as you define success in your operation, depends on your intimacy with the living soil. It's not something that you can just think, well, that's a median that's going to grow my crops. You think about what this soil does for you. Put your kids through college. Puts food on the table. It really sustains your life. It helps you to give to others that are in need. Helps you be a good steward. It is a very connector of who you are with creation. And it is a very intimate relationship. It's not something we can take lightly. And without developing an intimate relationship with something that's alive that gives you so much, how are you ever going to reach your potential as a producer? Little story of, that I've got about uh, um, something I learned last year in Memphis at the Beneficial Ag Conference. I learned that worldwide Sustenant farmers, if they're female, can outproduce by 40% men that are sustenant farmers. Why is that? Women will always outproduce men. If they're sustenant farmers, and the majority of the crops that are grown in the world, if, uh, more than half, is through sustenant farming where people are trying to stay alive. 
Why is it the females can do better? They're providers. They're providers. Why else? Nurturers. Nurturers. That's the word I was looking for. They are created different, right? They're created to be nurturers. Get your wives involved. Get your daughters involved. Because they're the ones that will understand the intimacy that is required. Especially when they're ladies like this, that the only way that their kids are going to get fed is if they develop an intimate relationship with that soil. They understand it much better than men do. And they're better producers. My great-grandmother, incredible producer, intimate relationship with the soil. Won one of the first governor's conservation awards in the state of Oklahoma was my great-grandmother, not my great-granddad. But uh, what was amazing was that this guy that was speaking had been in charge of a big climate change thing, right? He was speaking on climate change. He's not the enemy. But he was speaking on climate change, and they had 150 research scientists in this group. And they did not understand why women were so much better at producing. Obviously, we're, we're still in the Bible Belt here. We understand creation. We understand how incredible women could be in the nurturing gift that they have. But this research scientist stood up there and he, he said, we really don't know why. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? It's so obvious. They're nurturers. And that's what we are as producers. We have to nurture the soil because it provides for us. That's what she was. An amazing nurturer. A lover of the land that instilled that in every generation since. What if we don't develop intimacy? What if we don't develop this passion for the soil that enables us to help our soil be alive and grow and produce? What if we don't? I mean, as a nation, and even as a world, over time, if we don't develop this intimacy, what's going to happen? More degraded soils, less production, more inputs, more bankruptcies, more suicides. That's the result of turning your back on this intimacy with the soil. That's it. And there's no denying that. I don't know how long that'll take. It might take 500 more years. But it, populations are going to grow. We are going to need more food eventually. I'm not going to tell you it's in 10 years or 20 years or 100 years. But eventually we will. And if we continue to degrade soils like we have, then, then there's going to come a tipping point. The soil is a great connector of lives and the source and the destination of all. It is the healer, restorer, and resurrector by which disease passes into health, age into youth, death into life, and without proper care for it, we will have no community. Because without proper, proper care of it, we will have no life. Wendell Berry, one of my favorite quotes. There is nothing more critical in production ag than one, to be sustainable, we have to learn how to make money. But we have to do that in parallel and in unison with the soil that is driving it. Because it's alive and it cares for us. What if we do? I can tell you this, on our place, we went from horrible debt to manageable debt to buying land. Buying land. And now I'm being asked to be on boards and do this kind of stuff. I never would have dreamed it. Never would have dreamed this would have happened 20 years ago, 22 years ago. But if you do develop that intimacy, that relationship with the soil, where you understand that it's alive, it's a part of your system that has to be fed and cared for, then you'll stop doing some of the things that kill it. And you'll start doing things that make it more alive. Uh, we're not zero fertilizer. Obviously, I told you about our cotton in 2018. But I will be there. I will be to the point where I can grow crops without chemical inputs because I believe with everything I have that for every problem we have in production agriculture, there is a biological fix. We just got to figure out the system. And we got to stop throwing chemistry at it. Chemistry kills, biology is alive. Thank you very much. Now, I do have one more thing I want to touch on before I finish up. I got these questions, and there's some students in the room, local students. Is that you all right back there? The local students that are here visiting, would you all stand up? I think it's amazing that you all are willing to come out here today. Look at all of them. 
I love it. I love it. I love it. So important. The future of our industry is right there. And they have a couple questions for me. So I'm going to ask them and answer them right here at the same time. Um, what type of, what is your ground like and, uh, and how, what is it like in Oklahoma? Um, it's a living soil, just like it is about everywhere if it's cared for right. Uh, we have some really good soils in Kay County. We have some of the best soils in the state. And also in Kay County, we have some of the shallowest, toughest soils to manage in the state with our limestone uh, um, southern Flint Hills. So we have, we have very, very, very diverse soils. We've got blow sand and heavy clays in the same field. And that's pretty common on a river bottom. A lot of y'all that have river bottom have said that. Um, <laughs> how much land do you farm? Uh, enough. <laughs> I farm enough right now, that's for sure. We don't, we're not looking for any more. Um, we're not going to rent any more ground, although I would trade some of my farms for some better farms. But uh, we farm plenty. What kind of animals do you have on the ranch? Oh my. Uh, we got big whitetails. Some of y'all will be interested in that. We got some of the biggest whitetails, I think, in the world, thanks to my son. Incredible wildlife manager. Uh, we've got cows, obviously. Uh, we've got coyotes fun to hunt. We got, we got feral hogs at the ranch. We do not have them at our farm yet, but we've become very good shots. We kill a ton of them and we hire helicopters. We don't have to pay for them, but we get helicopters in to kill them. Killed 188 a couple of years ago in one day with a helicopter on our ranch. So we didn't have any 10 years ago. So we have feral hogs too. And then we have literally, as far as living organisms, literally have over six billion living organisms per handful of soil. Think about that kids, over six billion plus. Some soils maybe 10 billion living organisms in one handful of soil. That is amazing. That is the life giver of our system, is the soil. That's where most of our life is. Significantly more pounds of living life below the soil than there is above the soil. 10, 20 times. I don't know what the number is. I just know it's a whole lot more. All right, a couple more questions. I love these student questions. Oh, so what was your best success been in the last couple of years? Probably that cotton crop. Although, a fairly close second was some ground that we had in preventing planting this year. Weird, right? Preventing planting, how's that going to be more successful? We had cover crops out there. And I don't know if there's anybody from the USDA here, I don't want to get in trouble for this, but what we did, we had all this seed out there, right? And it had been flooded, and we had to prevent any planting. And some of it, most of the fields were flooded where it wasn't any good, and all we did was catch, you know, three to six inches of silt, which was awesome. But there were some high ground that had, uh, that had some seed left in it. So we went out and harvested some of that, and it sold for $12 a bushel. It was nuts, and it was a blend. The blend, we scalped it, ran it through a scalper and scalped it off and we sold it and then we replanted a lot of it ourselves. But it was rye, um, winter barley, VNS, VNS for variety not stated, <laughs> and some vetch in there was the main. There were other things in there too, but some of that winter killed. Um, where do you see your best success um, in farming and ranching? Right there. It's my best success. My kids, my kids. Um, wow, it gets emotional. Um, uh, my wife's name's Laurie. Uh, oldest son is Jacob. Uh, next one down, I win wrote him every two years. Uh, next one down is Reagan, then Rachel, and then Reese. And Reese is the one that keeps me up at night. <laughs> She's a live wire, man. Oh my gosh, I hope this is being, Reese, if you're watching this on YouTube, you are my problem. <laughs> but I love you, but I love you. <laughs> She's also the most fun. Um, um, being the fourth generation on your farm and ranch, what have you learned the most over the past years? And I shared a lot about that. I learned how important it is to have an intimate relationship with that which gives you so much, your soil. So, thank you all very much. Is there any questions out here? How did I do on time? Good, good. Oh, there you go. I normally walk around quite a bit, but I was scared I was going to fall or something, so I just <laughs> stayed standing right here.
How many of your neighbors have you converted? Is everybody all of them? Switch? All of them. All of them. Uh, you can drive from Blackwell to Ponca City right now, and there's one farm that's still tilled. Really, I mean, some of them they'll go in there and they'll do a little recreational tillage here and there, but one of them that really isn't. He happens to be my cousin. Hard-headed. He was a superintendent of the biggest school district in Oklahoma for a while. He, he's very intelligent. I just don't know why he just. He just, he's, he just still goes out and works at Plants Wheat, and he's retired. Good guy, just, that's the only one, but by far the majority. And uh, we had some horrible flooding this year because of the timing, but overall our frequency of flooding has gone down a lot because we've got trillions of little dams between here and the headwaters up at Pratt. So much of the Shkatsky River bottom has been converted to no-till that it's really helped us quite a bit. I heard another guy say the other day that one of the hindrances to sharing no-till is competition. You know, why do we want to educate our neighbors to do this? One thing to remember is that, that you've got a, this, this intimate relationship with the soil and you love the land, right? That's number one. But also, we're already 10 and now 20 years ahead of a lot of these guys. They'll never catch up because this soil will continue to improve. Our, our management practices will continue to get better. So really, I'd love them to get started because someday, who knows, I might want to buy that property and I'd love to have 10 years of no-till in it, you know? <laughs> now, my, my question's on cereal rye. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, in, we're in a wheat country, central South Dakota, and, and so you raise the wheat as a cash crop, correct, you harvest yep. And uh, so how, is it an issue trying to use cereal rye and winter wheat without contamination? Not at all. Our rotations just allow us to, to rotate out of it. And a lot of times the cereal rye, now this year was an exception because we were so wet, so a lot of it went to seed. It turned out to be a blessing because we were selling it. We just, you know, Keith, the green cover, uh, I called him up and said, hey, uh, I don't know what to do. All this cover crop, I was going to plant cotton in it and corn in it and all this, and I couldn't. He said, well, do you have quite a bit? And I said, well, not a lot, but what we have is pretty good. And he said, well, it's worth 25 cents a pound. I went, holy cow, are you kidding me? So I went and cleaned it, and we stored a bunch of it, and we sold it. And I was selling wheat for, you know, less than $4,000 a load at the time, and I was selling rye for $12,000 a load. Why would I care if rye encroaches? You know, <laughs> bring it on. Got a quick question for you. First off, thanks for um, sharing your story. It was very inspirational, mm -hmm. um, particularly the young, your son that you brought along with you. but. What's one piece of advice, you know, we got all the younger men and women in the back, but what's one piece of advice you might offer all of us and them included? To, uh, well, spe more sp thank you, I love that question. More specific to the youth that are in here, uh, whether you're in college or wherever, just realize that if some professor or some teacher tells you you can't cut it, you can't. Everyone is created perfect for their calling. So whatever your calling is, wherever you're gonna end up with, Stay in line with the Holy Spirit, stay in prayer, realize that His calling is perfect for you and He created you perfectly for that. So in your calling, whatever it is, you're a genius. You're a genius. You are the best available for that calling. And uh, that'd be the main thing. And I would say that for a lot of us too as adults, we tend to forget that. That we were created for where we're at because we're following the Lord's calling. Therefore, you're a genius in that area. You're as good as it gets in that area. He has equipped you perfectly for what you do.